I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Duckworth Library at Young Harris College and the Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Our guest is Lonnie King, one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and a leading expert in the history of the civil rights movement, particularly in Georgia. Lonnie, we're delighted to have you. It's my pleasure being here, Bob. Arlington, Georgia. Yes. Deep in South Georgia. Deep, deep South Georgia. <laughs> Ruled by Jim Crow laws in a society where racial discrimination was commonplace. What was it like growing up there? Well, I lived there from the time I was born until I was eight. And um, even though I was very young, I understood that the system required you, if you were black or Negro or nigger, that you get off the sidewalk or you conform to the culture of that time, which was that you were a second-class citizen at best. Give us some of your experiences growing up there as a youngster. Well, when I was about, must have been about six, I guess, or seven in that neighborhood, um, Eugene Talmadge was um, running for governor, one of his last times, I think, or next to the last time. And he used a crop duster. I didn't know what that was at the time. I just knew it was a plane, but it was a crop duster. And the crop duster was dropping leaflets all over Arlington and I guess all, in some other places too. And uh, I happened to pick up a leaflet and I took it home to my granddaddy who was a preacher, Reverend Joseph Smith. And uh, as I read it, because they taught me how to read before I went to school, it was nigger and this, nigger this, nigger that, keep the niggers in that place, you name it. And so I asked granddad, I said, what is a nigger? <laughs> because I did not know what a nigger was at the time. Certainly, certainly I didn't know I was one. And so he tried to explain to me something about Talmadge. And at the same time, uh, my granddaddy and my grandmother both were kind of, I guess you would say, secret supporters of the NAACP. And when I say secret, um, to say that you were a black person and that you were involved with the NAACP in any way in the South at that time, it was almost like a deaf thing because the Southern politicians who were in charge always saw the NAACP, uh, especially with its, its avowed mission of ending um, lynching and what have you, as being anathema to what they had in mind, which is to keep the races separate and also keep whites in power and dominant. My granddaddy said to me um, that uh, he was recruiting memberships for the NACP. I think they were 50 cents a piece at that time for the, for the membership. And he said that one day, son, uh, this organization is going to get us out of slavery. He said, we are still in slavery. The only difference is that we can go home at night. But everything else is about the same. Or there, are no, there are no rights that you have that uh, white man is bound to respect, including the smallest white child. My, my granddaddy was, um, I guess they called him an, an evangelist in the sense that he went around all over the North, uh, um, North Alabama and that part of Georgia uh, holding revivals. Um, and I went with him sometime. He was a very eloquent speaker and he was a note singer. Do you, you know what a note singer is? Mm -hmm. Okay. A note singer is someone who sings a cappella. Mm -hmm. uh, they raise these hymns and the crowd join, join in and so forth, so forth and so on. But he was my inspiration, I guess, at a young age. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it reminds me somewhat, as I reflect on it now, Bob, of uh, John Locke's um, admonition back in the 17th century when he said that a child is born with a blank slate. And it's what you put on that child's slate during those first six years of his or her life, well, what he did, he said his life, uh, is going to have a lot to do with how that child ends up in life. Mm -hmm. And I think I had on my slate before I was eight um, a kind of uh, orientation from my granddaddy that uh, served me well when it was time to make a change here in 1960. Your granddaddy couldn't vote? No. Couldn't vote. That was no such thing. <laughs> White primary? Yes. Had no voice at all in no. government, even no. local government. No. Yeah. When did you first realize that you wanted to become part of what was to be a long struggle for civil rights? Well, <clears throat> I left 
Well, let me tell you a little, a little incident that still sticks in my mind. Uh, when I was about 13 years of age, Bob, I was learning how to play table tennis at John Hope Elementary School up on Boulevard. You lived in Atlanta. I lived time. in Atlanta by that time. I, I had moved here from the time I was nine. Uh, my granddad had died, and that's, so my, I came to stay with my mother then. Well, I went by, we would go by this white gas field. Now, let me give you a little history. Uh, Bob Woodruff, who, who headed the Coca-Cola company, also had a trust company and the white motor company at the same time. And the white gas field was owned by the white motor company. And they used to park their, their trucks out there. But it was right behind John Hope School. So one day I was walking through there and the caretaker, it was about six o'clock maybe, and the caretaker was there, white guy, big guy, and his dog, he had, a, he had a dog that day, and the dog came out and tried to bite me. And so I kicked at the dog to keep him from biting me. Well, the um, big guy ran out and said, nigga, what you doing? What, what, what are you doing? You're kicking at my dog. Don't you move. And so, of course, I didn't move. He came over and slapped me down for kicking at his dog. Well, the statute of limitations has now passed. So I'm going to tell you, I came back that night. And I broke all the windows in that warehouse, all of them. <laughs> uh, so that was really my first um, violent touch with racism in Atlanta. Uh, I mean, I saw it on the buses and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, to be hit by someone when you hadn't done anything or try to protect yourself was really outrageous. Mm -hmm. I later on went into the Navy. And while I was in the Navy, um, that's when I think I really grew up because um, when I went to the Navy, I was, the, I was selected as the educational petty officer for my company. And my job was to try to get all of our recruits through boot camp from, from in terms of passing those tests. So when I finished with my 80-some guys, they put me in charge of, of about 30 people who were going to a ship called the USS Oriskany, CVA-34, that's just been, um, I guess you would say, uh, sunk down in just outside of Pensacola to become a natural reef. Well, when I got there, I saluted the officer of the day and handed him the, the 30 um, personnel folders. And they put us in something called the X-1 division. That's the orientation division for, for two weeks while they assess what job they're going to give you. At the end of two weeks, they gave me and the guy with the lowest GCT, which is intelligence score, the deck force. We, we had to go out and paint the, the ship. All the rest of the guys, I was the only black person there. The other, the other 29 guys were all white. So they put me and the guy with the lowest GCT in the deck force. And my job was to chip the paint. Well, well that wasn't good enough. Sure, sure enough, after about uh, maybe a month, I was then transferred to the head to clean the head. Now, the head is the, is the restroom. Now, mind, just imagine cleaning the restroom for 200 men. So it was a very depressing thing, to say, to say the least. But I went in there, and I decided that I would remember something that, that the Dr. Mays once told me when I was a freshman at Mohawk, because I only went there for one year before I went to the Navy, and then I came back. Dr. Mays once said that if it's your fate in life, to be a ditch digger or whatever, do it like no one else other than God. Do that job the, the best that, that, that you can. And so I went in here and I painted up the place, uh, got it spick and span, shined all the brass, and I turned that S job into a um, kind of like a lock. So I could then uh, go out after I take my half an hour cleaning up in the morning. After, and clean up in the afternoon and read. I want you to know, Bob, that after about four or five months of this, a third class petty officer, white guy, put in a billet, put in a chit to take my job. In other words, I, 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 I had taken a job that was nobody wanted, painted it up, turned it around, and when I got it to the point where it was a job where you only had to work about an hour a day, Somebody Some, took it. That's right. 
<laughs> so that was a big lesson for me. So they sent me back to the deck force. Uh, and so that time I said, let me get out of here. And so I started applying for different billets that came up, different jobs that came up. So I applied for the dental technician school to go to San Diego. Well, before I got the answer on going to dental technician school, I um, saw an ad in the plan of the day. That's the bulletin for a dispersing clerk striker. That's someone who can go down as a trainee. And so I went down there and applied for the job. And uh, instant J.C. Claren, um, who was in charge, said that we don't want you down here. And I said, why? He says, well, you're black. No, you're Negro. And we're all white down here. We don't, we don't want any Negroes in here. So I went to um, see the chaplain of the, of, the, of the ship and told him about it. And he said, oh, he, they, they didn't say that, did they? I said, yes, they did. So then he just tried to counsel me about the, the conditions and what have you, and you have to accept certain things. So I was burning. So I then went to my division officer in the deck force. He was a lieutenant from, Lieutenant J.G. from um, Louisiana named Horn. I told him what happened. He said, come with me. He got me up and took us down to see Ensign J.C. Claren, the guy who told me that he, that he didn't want us down there. And he said, Mr. King, he gave me the, the handle. Mr. King tells me that you don't want him down here. Let me hear you tell me that. And he said, well, it's really not me, but it's, 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 it's these guys. I don't, I don't think it'll work down here. So Lieutenant J.G. Horn said to him, if you don't have his name in the plan of the day tomorrow that he's assigned to your office, I'm going to write the Chief of Naval Operations and find out how you got your commission. My name was in the plan of the day the next day. I tell you that story because even though I was kicked to the ground by the man when I was 13 who was white, it was a white man who went down and told another white man, if you don't give this man what he's entitled to, I'm going to get your commission. So, that, so when, that, when those kind of things happen to you, you begin to say, you know, democracy is like mercury. It, it's very slippery. But you do have people, regardless of race, who, are, who believe in trying to make things happen in a democratic way. Mm -hmm. And so I went down there and I did well. I, got, I, became, a, I, came, I became an E-5 in the inside of about 18 months. I did, I did very well. I came out as an E-5 after, after three years, uh, kind of on the fast track. But uh, I, got, I had people to treat me badly down there. But finally, after a while, they came around. Um, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I would not stay in. I said, no, I don't want to stay in. I want to come back. And I told a friend of mine on the... Um, we were in, in what you would call the front of the ship. We, we, we call it the forecastle. Um, in Hong Kong, China, uh, in 1956, and he was getting out, going back to San Francisco to work for the, for Pacific Bell. I said, "Well, I'm going back to Atlanta," and I said to him, his name was Everett Render. I said, "Everett, you know, one day we're going to get a chance to get this yoke off our back as black people or as Negroes, and I want to be back in Atlanta." And, be, and play a role in that. Now that happened in 56. So when I came back in 57, I played football and uh, did very well on the football team and got somewhat, got somewhat of a following. Um, and um, when the movement began up in Greensboro on February the 1st, on the 2nd of February, I was in the, I was in the, in the drugstore organizing, uh, saying we have to do it here. And I talked to my friend Joseph Pierce and Julian Bond, whom I had met, and the three of us went all around and began to organize. And uh, we pulled together thousands of people to, to join this movement in Atlanta. And we'll talk about it in more detail as we, as we go on. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the foundation. Uh, my granddaddy, some incidents that happened in my life uh, before I got to Morehouse and, and some after I got to Morehouse and, in the Navy, I think played a major role in inculcating in me this desire to try to change the system. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, when I t took uh, civics in high school, uh, I actually believed it when I, when I heard 
them say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, etc. Mm -hmm. And when you believe in that, then you're going to try to see what you can do to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to know that we, a lot of us thought the same way, and we did it without bullets. We did it without dynamite. We, we, we did it with an idea mm -hmm. and our bodies mm -hmm. and making a the, making the, making the witness for the cause. And I think had, we been, I think had, had it been a violent revolution, uh, it, we, we, we'd still be segregated because we, we didn't have guns, so we had to appeal to the moral conscience of people who were not black, who were willing to say there's something wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a minute about Morehouse. Okay. Many, many civil rights leaders came from Morehouse. Yeah. Dr. King, you, Julian Bond. Charles Black. Charles Black, Senator Johnson, Leroy yes. Johnson, yes. Hamilton Holmes. Yes. And, uh, yes. Uh, what made Morehouse such a key element in the civil rights movement? It, had, it has to have, okay. You had a man named Mordecai Johnson who graduated from Morehouse in about 1910, 1911. He became the first black president of Harvard University. A great orator, talked for two or three hours like Castro. <laughs> um, Mordecai Johnson recruited Dr. Mays to come to Morehouse. Now Mordecai was the president of Howard. Mays was his dean of religion. So he got Mays to come to Morehouse. Mays, in my view, became probably the greatest schoolmaster of all times in the sense that he carried himself in such, on, on such a high plane, intellectually, the way he dressed, his mannerisms, until people wanted to imitate him. And Mays was always preaching about the fact that you have a mission if you're a Morehouse man. If you, if you were lucky enough to get into these seats, that means that you are part of a group of people who can lead this nation. And um, the other part of that speech that he made that I mentioned earlier was that if it's your fault to be a doctor, be the very best doctor, Lord, he went on down the line, and then he, of course he mentioned the thing about the garbage collector and what have you. But his, but his thing was, you can do it as well as anyone else. And um, in order to get into Morehouse, and, and I'm hope, I hope I don't get into too, 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 too much trouble here, but, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> some of your brightest young black men were sent to Morehouse by, by people from all over the country because Mays was there. And for 27 years, he was a beacon that people looked up to uh, and wanted to follow in many of the things that he uh, preached. Julian Bond told me this story. He said that uh, within days of the first sit-in in Greensboro, you came to him and talked him into <laughs> beginning a movement in Atlanta. Yeah, that's true, but it wasn't days, it was actually the next day. Uh, I had met Julian when I came back from the war in 1957. Um, and at that time, when you went to Morehouse, you had to stand in line to register for hours, like all day long. And so therefore, if you were standing next to somebody that you did not know, after eight hours or so of standing there, you're going to get to know that person, right? So Julian and I happened to be standing next to one another in 57 when I came back. And um, I, I learned a lot about him. I learned that he had been a Time Magazine uh, apprentice when he was in high school, that he wrote well, whether, whether he was a writer. His daddy was dean of uh, education at AU. And I think he might have been born, I think he was born in Fort Valley, maybe, but he lived a lot in Philadelphia. So when we got ready to put the movement together, I said we need to have somebody who writes well. And um, so, I, so I went to Julian because I knew he could write. Um, and I went to Joe because Joe's an, Joe, Joe, Joe's an organizer, Joe Pierce. Mm -hmm. And um, so the three of us actually pulled this thing together. Now, the college presidents, though, I learned um, belatedly had a tremendous network uh, that we weren't aware of. And so when they heard that we were doing all this stuff, they called us in uh, to have a summit conference on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, they told us about the fact that they had uh, a responsibility as a, as a trustees for these children and that 
we were running the risk of getting everybody hurt or, or maybe even kill some of them. And so they all were speaking to us like older parents. But when, and they went, Clement was first, Mays was second, then Manley. They were kind of going in order of seniority, I guess. <clears throat> so when they got to Dr. Harry V. Richardson, who is the head and who had the Interdenominational inter Theological Seminary, ITC Center, I'm sorry. He looked at the other, preach other preachers and people there, and he said, oh, I think the students are right. He broke ranks with the other presidents. I mean, it was shocking to see him do that, because he was a part of the six, the big six. And he went on to give a lecture on, on the evils of segregation and how we need to do something about it, and he's going to back us. The next person to speak was Dr. Frank Cunningham from Morris Brown, philosopher. He gave an eloquent speech back in Harry Richardson. So by this time, you have four presidents who are basically saying, go back to class, and two who are saying, well, we're with you. So, so we had them split <laughs> because the common denominator was that everyone in the room was a Negro. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what we were trying to do if we, were, if we were successful, would benefit everybody in the room. So May, uh, Clement, clever man, said, well, if you're going to do it, why don't you write up a petition as to why you want to do this? And so now I know he had in mind that if we sat down and wrote, then that was going to get us to stop. <laughs> and so we humored them. We said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> And so I signed um, um, Rosalind Pope from uh, Spelman. She's the president of Spelman Student Government Association. And Julian Bond, uh, I believe Morris Dillard, I think I put it in, Abbott Brinson, and asked them to draft this document. They came up with something called an appeal for human rights. Um, that document, Dr. Dr. Clement raised $12,000 from someplace and uh, paid for it. It cost about $4,000 to be in all of the newspapers. And that document was read into the congressional record. Uh, it was reprinted uh, in completely free by the New York Times. And it's still one of the, I think it's probably the only document of its kind that the students wrote that's still around. Mm -hmm. um, but in that document, we basically said that uh, we cannot continue to sit passively by and have our rights meted out to us one at a time. And then we, we um, enumerated all the things that were wrong in Atlanta and therefore in the South, and that we were going to use nonviolent means to change this. And that document resonated in the black community and in the white community, but in the conservative white community or in the racist white community. The governor was Ernest Vandiver, <coughs> uh, who, by the way, uh, if I may just say something parenthetically, when he, when he died here, here a few months ago, a few, year, a few months ago, I guess, I didn't know who they were talking about. <laughs> I mean, it was such a glowing um, <coughs> tribute to this gentleman. But anyway, when the appeal appeared, and you can check the record in the newspapers, Vandiver's comment was that this couldn't have been done by any college student in Georgia. It had to have been written in Moscow. In other words, he just ignored the fact that it was done by black students, not any college student. Which, which, which really was a sad commentary on the quality of education in his mind that we were offering in this school, uh, in the school system. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we, um, we moved on. That was done on the 9th of March, 1960. And then on the 15th of March, uh, we sat in, in about 11 different places and um, started our movement. And before it was over, we had thousands of students with us. And we pulled off the big boycott on, on Richards. And, and then it was the not difficult history. to recruit students, was it? Pardon me now? It was not difficult to get students. Well, yeah, it was, in a way. Um, early on, it was difficult because you were talking about an untried, untested something. But after this, I think students saw that other students in the rest of the country were, were beginning to, in the rest of the South, were beginning to join in. I think it was a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. um, people like to do that. Um, I think Thorsten Veblen, uh, in his book, the, the Theory of the Leisure Class, called it honorific consumption. People like to keep up with other people. Uh, so when we got the movement going, I think people felt 
that they ought to join it. But now all the students didn't join now, but most of them did. Mm -hmm. Most of them did. And, and you had pledged nonviolence. Yes. Was that difficult with these young students? Uh, did they want to fight or did they want to? We had some students, some who are prominent in Atlanta right now, who refused to participate because they said that, that they could not be nonviolent. We had to make sure that we had students who were willing to take the blows if necessary in order to do this. And, you know, that's very, it's kind of like a brainwashing in a way. You got to brainwash somebody to not follow their normal instincts. If somebody hits you, you know, you're going to try to protect yourself. Uh, but what we said to people in Atlanta is this. We said, we're not suggesting that you adopt nonviolence as your way of life, per se, but at least in the short term, adopt it as a strategy because we believe that this strategy can work. It, it worked in India, and we think it, that, it can, that it can work here. Uh, we, we've got to give credit, though, to uh, Jim Lawson out of uh, Nashville and Martin King uh, for pushing this idea. But we were pretty much nonviolent from, from, from the day those four boys sat down. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have any pictures of any students with any guns, or any knives, or any billy clubs trying to beat up anybody. Mm -hmm. All we were asking for, and all of us were well-dressed, and we went in to say, we, we want the opportunity to have the chance to sit down and eat a hamburger. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, anticipate uh, violence on the part of the white yeah. people? You oh, yeah. Did? Yeah, because, because um, Bob, if, if you go back and look at the history, there were several hundred slave revolts in this country. Not one was successful. Not one. And the reason that they were not successful was because of something called the Slave Patrol. See, soon after blacks became the labor force, the cheap labor force in this country, on the southern plantations especially, you had to have some kind of law and order force to m keep the system going. And so they literally hired men, white men, as slave patrols, and they are all over the South. Now, the slave patrols were succeeded by the Klan who in turn were succeeded by some white policemen like Bull Connor. Mm -hmm. So there is a logical uh, you know, escalation uh, or continuation of this idea of control um, of the um, black folks who might revolt. Mm -hmm. uh, so we expected violence because uh, every last one of those slave revolts uh, ended up in violence and people being killed. Uh, you can go back to the 1700s. People tried to get out and, and they were killed. Um, um, Denmark Vesey uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, in, in by 1823, 24, led what some consider to be the largest revolt ever. And of course, the folks that he was trying to free, some of them told about the possible insurrection. So they arrested about 50 people and they executed most of them. Uh, and, I, and I go on and on and on where we have these situations where every time someone tried to break out of the mold, they got shot, they got lynched, they got run out of town, something. Uh, in fact, it was generous, and you were lucky if you got run out of town. Most of the time, you got shot, mm -hmm. like, 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 like Emmett Till did. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we expected some violence. But, Bob, let me say this to you. <clears throat> it's very difficult for you as a white man to understand what was happening at that time from my perspective. But... What I saw is that we will never get free unless we create a critical mass of people who are yearning and saying the same thing at the same time. And at the same time, we wanted to open up our arms to people who didn't look like us, who wanted to help us make that happen. And once we got that critical mass together, then it was a question of direction for that mass, and it worked out. But, but none of us expected to live this long. But there is one thing I think that was a common denominator for most of us, and that was simply this. This was an idea that is so powerful until you're willing to give your life for it. And once you arrive at that conclusion about any idea in your mind, you're a dangerous person. Because if somebody cannot threaten you with, ex with extinction, extinction, or killing you, you then realize that you have come somewhat free. 
and that you can move on. And you'll take chances that people ordinarily wouldn't take. But how, why could we not do that? The NACP for, by that time, by 1960, had been around for um, 61 years, roughly. And they had done a tremendous job of trying to end lynching, but they never could get the lynching ended. But they won a lot of court cases. But remember what we said in that, in that appeal, our rights were being meted out one at a time. So it's, it's buses today, it's schools tomorrow, you know, on down the line. It, it would have taken 100 years to have gone through all those rights through the courts. Plus, the courts are political. As you can see over the last 50, 50 years, you know, people started getting more conservative people on the court to try to change the laws or water them down. But the NACP, they pioneered this idea of class action, where you can get one person that, you rep that, that represents the class and um, bring a lawsuit. Well, by 1960, the class wanted to speak for itself. And so therefore, the NACP was caught off guard. <laughs> uh, and therefore, they were on the wrong page uh, of these young people. But you see, we were in a war. We've been in a war ever since 1619. And wars are, won, are fought and won by young people. Mm. Bob, people like you and me, we, are the, we become the generals. <laughs> but it's the young people who go out there and face the wolves, who face Afghanistan, who face Iraq. And we were the young folks who were facing the Afghanistans of that time. And we were, we were lucky enough to be living today, some of us, um, to be able to talk about um, what happened during that time. So you went up to Raleigh? Oh yeah. And formed SNCC? Yeah, well let me tell you about that. Um, you, you have all kinds of revisionisms going on about what happened back in the Civil Rights Movement, but one of the things that um, is not well known is the fact that I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church. I joined there in 1945 when I came here. Daddy King, M.L. King's junior father, baptized me and I was a very I was very active in that church. So when we when when we got to a certain point and we looked around and I saw Bob that that the antitrust pass laws were passed in Virginia first. And within a matter of two or three weeks they were passed in Maryland, <laughs> North Carolina, South Carolina, all the, all over the South. And so I told the students that, uh, with my committee, I said, we need to organize Southwide. I said, let me see, can I call uh, uh, ML, I, we, we, I called him ML because I, I knew him well, and see if we can get him to call a meeting for us. So I took, my, I, so Julian Bond, Marion Wright, and I went to see him down Auburn Avenue. And uh, we went in there to argue for SNCC being formed, not SNCC, but us to be organized as a unit. My argument was that I, I have never read in history of any unorganized group of folks whipping an organized group of people. If you're going to battle the racists, you're going to have to organize and battle them. I mean, you can't just hope that somehow God's going to shine on you <laughs> and come and fight the battle for you. Uh, you have to fight it, fight it yourself, but you need to be organized. Uh, he agreed with that and instructed Ella Baker, who was at the time his, his uh, acting executive, to call the meeting. And so she called her alma mater, Shaw, and got the meeting set up for there. So Martin King really was the person who called us all together mm -hmm. at that meeting. Uh, and from that meeting, of course, was, was found the, uh, the shock troops all over the South, the mm -hmm. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They didn't have that many people, but they had a lot of courageous people. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of courageous people, you then, we were, we were then able to utilize the media. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, I am convinced that if, that if the media had not come of age in, by 1960, all of us would probably been, ha have been killed. Mm -hmm. We were, nobody, I don't care how virile a racist, even Bull Connors, well, maybe not Bull Connors, but, but most of the virulent, virulent racists would not want to be seen uh, on NBC News beating up on a kid who's just trying to get a, get a hamburger mm -hmm. or having a dog bite him. They just did not want to do that. Now, 
If the cameras had not been there, though, trust me, it would have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it's almost like a man beating his wife, you know. It's, he doesn't want the wife to tell it, but if the, but if the neighbors hear it, he's somewhat embarrassed by that. Why are you beating your wife? Yeah. You know, why are you beating up these kids and all they want to do is have a lunch and have a hamburger? So um, we reorganized and we put on blue jeans and went to southwest Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, where the real, real deep south is, and began to change the political structure down there. Now, the story of how America changed on race relations is really more embedded in the history of SNCC than it is in any other organization other than, S other than the uh, NACP. Did you realize at the time that, uh, that bringing students into the movement would go as far as it did? No, I realized that, it, that, it, that bringing students into the movement would, would maybe get us the benefits that we were looking for initially, which was basically public accommodations. I did not know, I did not have enough foresight to know that it was going to be the catalyst for the Voting Rights Act and for the, uh, so, well, I thought that we'd get the Civil Rights Bill, but not the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the, all that came about as a, kind of like an offshoot of the whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So after the Voting Rights Act, uh, SNCC, let's, let's tell folks what SNCC is. Okay, SNCC was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee formed over Easter weekend uh, in 1960 at Shaw University. Uh, the first chairperson was Marion Barry, who ended up being the mayor of Washington, D.C. Uh, next was John Lewis. Uh, after John Lewis, I believe it, I think it was, uh, no. Next was Chuck McDoo, I think, uh, out of Minnesota, and then John Lewis, and then later on Stokely Carmichael, and then Rat Brown. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the uh, lineage there in terms of the leadership. Uh, we were people who put on overalls to go into the cotton fields to try to register people to vote. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a tough time, tough time to go down there and do that. I did not personally do any of that, uh, but I have a lot of friends who did it. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, now let's talk a little bit about Dr. King. He, he mm -hmm. was very supportive oh, yeah. of the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that he, as you said, he was instigator of your organization. How closely did you work with Dr. King's uh, uh, SCLC Actually, it was, a, it was a kind of an intermittent relationship. You know, I, I got him involved in the stick situation. And then um, <clears throat> the students went home for the summer from the AU Center of 19, in 1960. So I had a core of people here planning for the fall. And so what we planned on was to put the issue of race on the minds of the people running for president. It was Kennedy and Nixon. So what we did was that we focused on Richard's department store here, which became Macy's, and we wanted to do it on the uh, 19th of October, 1960. Magnolia Room. Magnolia. Well, more than just that. It's all of Richard's places. Well, I recommended to our committee that we try to get Martin King Jr. to go to jail with us because that would guarantee international publicity for us. And I also said that I want to I want to recommend that we send Richard Nixon and John Kennedy a telegram uh, asking them to take a stand on the issue of race because here's what was happening. They were having the presidential election, presidential debates, and if you had been from Mars, you wouldn't have known any black folks were in this country. And you certainly would not have known that thousands and thousands of young black kids and some white kids, too, were raising heck all over the South from Maryland all the way over to Texas. So when I met with, 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 with King in, in August of uh, 1960, I told him my plan. He agreed to do it. Well, the night before, the night before we were going down there, I had her, I asked Rochelle Sullivan, who was my co-chairman, like the vice chairman, to call him, because she didn't know him, and she had just come back from uh, Europe. But so I said, well, just tell him that I ask you to call him, and he'll talk to you. So she called him and told him that she wanted, uh, she was calling for me, and that she wanted him to come to the bridge tomorrow. Well, she didn't even get a chance to get that far. He said, well, I've decided that I can't come. So um, 
she came back and she said, uh, um, Lonnie, he says that, that he can't come. I said, her, she'll talk to the students. Let me go talk to him. So I, so I called him back and I said, Emil, Herschel tells me that, that you can't come. He says, well, Lonnie, uh, I'm on probation for having, for taking Lillian, Lillian Smith <laughs> to the airport. <laughs> and they arrested me. And, uh, uh, and he said, I, he said, I, uh, he said, my advisors are telling me that I, that I ought not to risk this because they're going to re re revoke my, what was it uh, that they give you? They put you on probation, I guess. So they were all on the phone, you know, had party lines at, at, at that time. Folks today don't know what party lines were, but, but they had these, they had all these different extensions. So you had Y.T. Walker on the phone, you had A.D. King, his brother on the phone, his dad on the phone, uh, all ranting and raving at me, I'm going to get him in trouble. But I refused to talk to them because I had known him since 45. So we had this conversation. Just, just imagine what, it, what it's like, Bob, to have a conversation with four or five folks on the phone, but you're only talking to one person. You're ignoring the rest of them, which is what was happening. So we, we, we went through this thing, and so I heard all the reasons why. And I said, well, ML, let me say something to you. You can't lead from the back. You got to lead from the front. Now, I'm going to tell you why, why I did that. One of the famous sermons that his daddy used to make every year or two was that. The title was, You Can't Lead from the Back. So, my, I, so I hit him with his own sermon, although I wasn't talking to him, he, he, but he heard me. <laughs> <laughs> so when I said that, uh, he said, L.C., I was called L.C., Lonnie Cecil King. He said, uh, what time do you want me to be at V.A. Richards? I said, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he said, I'll be there. When he came the, the, the next morning, of course, we all got there at 10 o'clock, and four of us got arrested and went to jail, and the rest is history. John Kennedy won the presidency because what happened is that uh, the black community all over America switched from, from Nixon, because Nixon was viewed at that time, he wasn't viewed as a bad guy mm -hmm. in, the, in the black community. He, he had been the head of the President's Committee on Fair Employment. And even though that might have been a token thing, it was the only straw in the game. And mm -hmm. so Nixon did not have a negative view in the black community at that time. And he probably would have won that election uh, were it not for King having gone to jail and Kennedy's, Kennedy's brother and others got involved to try to get him out. Mm -hmm. um, every black community in America changed, switched from Nixon to Kennedy, except Atlanta. How about that? <laughs> the Atlanta black vote still went for Nixon. Let, let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> I can remember when a lot of the elder statesmen, uh, black elder statesmen, statesmen in Atlanta were Republicans. That's true. Uh, a lot of them. Yes. Uh, because of uh, Lincoln. Well, because of Lincoln and also because of Talmadge and others who were in the, who were in the Democratic white primary. Mm -hmm. We were not welcome in the Democratic Party. and so. If you're not welcome, you don't go over there. Um, but what you had, I've got to say this at some point if we don't get to it later on, is that we had a task here in Atlanta that maybe very few student leaders had the, the same problem other, in other places. We had to not only fight the white power structure, we also had to fight the black power structure too. Mm -hmm. because. Atlanta had put together a coalition under Hartsfield where the so-called good white people from Buckhead merged, merged with the Negro leaders from the South Side, and they formed this coalition that kept Hartsfield in office for 24 years. And from that coalition, a lot of the black leaders, or Negro leaders, were able to call the mayor and get their children out of jail and get a job every so often, what have you. So they had access. When you challenge the system head on the way we did, that made these folks over here who had access, who, who were Negroes, a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Am I going to lose my access? This boy is crazy. <laughs> He's going to get us all killed. Mm -hmm. And certainly I'm going to lose my access. Well, when you look at it, we had to battle those two different forces at the same time. It was, it was almost like going into a battle with one hand tied behind you. But the one thing that made us win that battle, it wasn't 
the black leaders. It was the $5 a day and car fare people who were riding those buses. We were able to call this boycott on riches and we were able to get people to send us their credit cards. I, I asked for, I asked the young, I asked the people to send me their credit cards, uh, Bob, to Rich's department store. And do you know 300 and some people sent me their credit card? Would you send your credit card to a college kid? I have. <laughs> Yo, it, was, it, was, it was your son, right? That's right. It's different. <laughs> but the one you didn't know, I, you, mean, I, mean, I you didn't know his mom, is there anybody? Yeah. But they sent me their credit cards. That, tell, that told me how deeply we had reached this community. So if they're sending you their credit card, you can make this happen. We put the credit cards down to Citizens Trust Bank, sent them back after, after the war card was over, but the bottom line is that it was symbolic. Mm -hmm. And the leaders, the Negro leaders at the time, were not leaders. That was an article, that was a cartoon in the, in the, in the, in the New York Times in 1960, in the spring. Um, and that cartoon was one which depicted the students out front, black students out front, parading, boycotting, you name it. Behind them were, were these Negro leaders, the NACP, the Urban League, and the caption was, the, the kids were running, other folks were behind them, the caption was, wait for me, we're your leaders. <laughs> <laughs> and Let me pilot. read you this quote. Yeah. yeah. Let me read you this quote from uh, former President Jimmy Carter who told Arthur Mar Mary King this, if you wanted to scare white people in Southwest Georgia, Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference wouldn't do it. You only had to say one word, SNCC. That's right. Do you realize that you were that powerful in the state? Well, we did not realize it, but at the same time we also knew that the one thing that the white power structure in the South was afraid of was this burgeoning Negro vote. And Bob, we still have not, even 50 years later, capitalized the way we should have on the vote. Georgia, to a great extent, is a red state today, not because of virulent racism, but because of non-feasance on the part of blacks who now have the chance to vote, but who, but who are not registering. Mm -hmm. We still have about uh, four to 500,000 African Americans in this state who are eligible to vote and who will not register for whatever those reasons are. Now, we did get 100,000 to register this past uh, summer to have Obama, mm -hmm. uh, but you still have a lot of them who are not registered. If we were to register in the proportions that we should, this would be a blue state. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other states in the South would also be blue states. Mm -hmm. So we still have this lingering legacy of non-participation on the part of, uh, of, of our people. And Bob, you could spend five or six lifetimes trying to overcome this problem. Uh, it will eventually be overcome, uh, but I recognize it as a shortfall in the movement. You open the door, but folks don't go through the door, mm -hmm. and as a result, the people who were opposed to you coming through the door in the first place have now taken over, solidified. But you didn't uh, meet the same resistance in Georgia that you did in some other southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, in, in registering voters, did you? Yeah, you had some serious problems in registering voters outside of Atlanta. Um, yeah, in those smaller towns, you did have some problems with uh, registering voters there. You mean, you mean recently or back during the 60s? Back during the 60s. Yeah, you had some problems outside of Atlanta, yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, the Atlanta, the jo Georgia has uh, several counties that have been identified in the 1964, 65, should I say, in Voting Rights Act where they were problem counties that are still, they still have to get preclearance. Um, and those counties that have to get preclearance are those counties that were problem counties in 1964. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lyndon Johnson once said that uh, the most effective tool that African Americans could have in this country would be the right to vote. There's no question about that. You see, if, 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 if the right to vote <clears throat> was something that uh, was not that good a thing, then why do people do not want to deny you? See, when the country was first started, Bob, as you well know, only white, white men 
landed gentry could vote. And they had property, you know, and you had also had, had to have property. Well, white men, though, in, with, with Andrew Johnson, Johnson uh, Jackson, were able to get the right to vote without all these fights in, the, in, in uh, 1820, 1828. So when you look at this thing, you know, and then black men got the right in, in 1866, 67, and women got it in uh, 1920, but, but it's been meted out. It's been a little bit out of time. But Johnson is right. If people voted, you'd, ha you'd have a different kind of system here. But this is a young democracy. Or should I say this is a democracy and that is still young. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that um, its best days are probably ahead as opposed to behind it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, America is going through a transition right now. Uh, Obama has raised the curve worldwide. Uh, and you're going to see, in my opinion, more people like Obama who are going to be running for office in, in countries that are predominantly white. Uh, you're going to see people who uh, are white all over the world taking a different view at America. See, because th three-fourths of the people in this country are not white. And therefore, or, or should I say in the world, are, are not white. And therefore, you're going to have to Take, take that into account with all this interdependence that we have. You see, we are so interdependent today until if you sneeze here, man, someone's going to get a little <laughs> sniffle someplace else because of all this, inter, this interdependence. Um, but you know what, though? With all the foibles that I've seen here, with all the problems that I've seen, I've been all over the world, um, and I'll tell you something. With all of our problems, this is still the best country in the world. And I do believe that we can make it even better. But it means that people of goodwill have to stand up and say, look, look uh, enough of this racism, enough, enough of this other stuff. Because a lot of folks don't understand why the whole concept of racism was invented in the first place. It was for economic reasons. It wasn't for color. The color thing was used as a basis for making some other people rich. Um, people who came here from Western Europe understood something. In order to be wealthy or successful, you have to have you have to have land, capital, entrepreneurship, and cheap labor. And it's the cheap labor that caused them to go to Africa. They they thought about going to India first, because the Indians over here wouldn't work for them. Because you know they 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 work a little while and then they run off into the mountains and, and you couldn't find them. <laughs> <laughs> but they they considered going to India, but that didn't work, so they went on to Africa because the Africans were immune to many of those, of those diseases that were, that were killing off people. Mm -hmm. But it, was all, it wasn't about race per se. Race was the, was the battering ram that was being used to divide people. And it's mm -hmm. still what's going on now. Let's get back to Atlanta for just sure. a minute. Uh, your sit-ins were successful. The, uh, the restaurants were uh, integrated. Uh, as I recall, though, it was dependent upon the schools and that was what, 1961? Yes. The big shots in mm -hmm. town decided they would uh, integrate the restaurants after the schools were integrated. Was yeah. that satisfactory to you? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. In fact, we had a knockdown, drag out fight at the Chamber of Commerce about that. Um, and um, I would not agree with it. Because, you see, you see, Bob, if you have won a battle, if you won the race, you're entitled to a victory lap. This battle that we had with the white power structure and the black power structure, they denied the students the victory lap mm -hmm. for political reasons. The black power structure were, were trying to hold on for dear life because a younger generation of black folks were going to take that place. And that, in fact, ultimately did take that place, like Jesse Hill, Leroy Johnson. So they were fighting for dear life. And what they had to do was to try to discredit the students. But it, but, it, but it didn't work because uh, the, the lunch counters were, in fact, desegregated. But yes, I had a monumental battle down at the Chamber of Commerce. But let me tell you, the person who convinced me to at least tentatively agree to it, subject to my going back to get it ratified by the students, it was John Calhoun, a big Republican. John Calhoun pulled me aside and he said, uh, Lonnie, I'm 60-some years old now, and every day of my life I've been segregated. If we're going to 
be able to go anywhere we want to go downtown to eat. Uh, by September, and this is now March, he said, uh, I'm for doing it. He said, remember now, I've been around for 60-some years, and, and, and now you've made it possible for us to go down there in a little over 60-some days. He said, so you've won the battle. I said, but John, we are being denied a victory lap. And so, so he, he, didn't, he didn't say any more. But let me say something else to you, Bob. We did more than just integrate the lunch counters. We filed a lawsuit, successful lawsuit, to integrate all the parks, recreation places. We also filed a lawsuit to integrate all the courthouses around here. Now, that's not well known, but we filed the lawsuit, won in federal court, and got all these things. So it was not just lunch counters. There were some other things, too. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've, uh, we've integrated, well, we were talking about lawsuits. Yeah. And we can go back to, uh, I guess, the, uh, the Baker case in 1954, which was the first big civil rights case that was decided by the Supreme Court. It seemed to me at that time that that was an avenue to file other court cases to do other things. Do you agree? Well. I would go a little bit further than the Baker case. Um, the Supreme Court began to more broadly interpret the 14th Amendment, in my view, as early as the 1930s, um, when they began to um, let blacks into um, professional schools. Mm -hmm. um, then in the 1940s, they, in Sweat versus Texas, uh, where they told the Texas legislature uh, that you, you have to build a school for blacks if you're not going to let them come to, you know, and of course they, they, you know, they built Texas Southern, but law school, but, uh, but, but that case was one. It was a progression of cases, uh, and, and you had the, um, um, restrictive covenant cases before then. So, so I think you saw a gradual expanding of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution um, using class actions as a mean or as a vehicle for making it happen. And so by the time of Baker and Brown and what have you, it was time to reverse Plessy of 1896. Let's tell people what Plessy was. Okay. Oh, uh, that's Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, a um, mulatto man in uh, New Orleans uh, got, on the, got on the train, uh, streetcar, whatever, and uh, he was denied a seat based on his race. And uh, he then took him to court. And the Supreme Court ruled uh, in 1896 that the law of the land would be separate but equal in public uh, transportation, but, that, but then that just kind of went to every other part of the, uh, the society. Um, it was later on, 58 years later, in, in Brown that Plessy was reversed. But let me just say this to you. When they made that decision in 96, 1896, it was a combination of a series of reversals that blacks had after the end of the, end of the Civil War. Uh, that was the federal government putting its imprimatur on what a lot of state governments had already done. Uh, plus, uh, you had a, a um, Supreme Court justice by the name of uh, Roger Taney or Taney, depending upon how you want to pronounce it. This man had a disproportionate influence on the Supreme Court in, the, in its direction for about 50 years. And he was, a, he was a racist, segregationist man who was a slave owner up in Maryland. And he dictated how that court was going to run. Uh, in fact, he's the one who wrote the, the, um, the, the majority opinion in uh, the famous case in, in, uh, in uh, 1957, no, I'm sorry, 181857. Um, wherein he said in, the, in that case um, that uh, the blacks of the Negroes have no rights that a white man is bound uh, to respect. 
And when you look at his history, you find that he controlled the federal court system like no other chief justice probably ever. And so even the district judges were pretty much under his umbrella. Uh, but the law is a very, very deliberate, very, very slow um, mechanism. And when people have been subjected to inhuman treatments for centuries, it's very difficult to ask them to continue for a few more centuries in the same situation. And that, that I mean, if, if you could just understand that by 1960, the idea of freedom for blacks had come, not just in the South, but in, a, in Africa and in other parts of the, of, the, of the third world. If you just look at it, they were having battles all over the place. Colonialism kind of pretty much ended during that period of time. Let's talk further about Plessy for a moment. Uh, as late as 1962, most politicians in the South were relying on Plessy as the, as the reason for separate but equal facilities. Uh, I think everyone knew that facilities were not equal, although they were separate. They knew that. Um, John Hope Franklin, in uh, his book, Up From Slavery, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, From Slavery to Freedom, talks about this, wherein he, he's able to show that when it came to allocation of public funds, you had allocation of public funds for education, two to three, four times, up to ten times more than for whites than for blacks. So the idea of separate and equal, that was never any equal. It was separate. The emphasis was separate and equal, it was on separate, not on equal. Mm -hmm. However, the Supreme Court after 54 <laughs> built a number, after the Supreme Court decision of 54, a number of, of southern states began to build what they call Supreme Court schools. They began to build schools all over the place, trying to catch up. Yeah. You know. So all of a sudden, they were hoping to um, build these neighborhood schools so that they could have children going to schools in that neighborhood. And you know what? That theory worked. Because we now have, to a great extent, a white noose around a black inner city in so many cities in America. Mm -hmm. And what's unfortunate in this, Bob, is that we have so many children who are still being denied a quality education to this, to this day, but we cannot blame entirely white politicians because some of the people who are, who are not doing what they should be doing look like me, who are running these school systems. Mm -hmm. And they spend more time trying to make sure that they get good jobs for their cronies and not enough time trying to educate these children. I don't believe that these kids can't learn but I think it requires commitment, whether it's a white teacher or a black teacher. Mm -hmm. I am extremely pleased to look at the kids from um, Teach for America. Ninety-some percent of those kids are white. But you know what they're doing as, as they go around America? They are turning the educational system upside down, quietly, but it's happening. Everywhere they go, and they, and they come in with commitment. Those kids can go anywhere but they make a choice to come in to help these kids, many of whom have never seen a daddy, mm -hmm. and try to get those children on some track to stop them from going to prison. And I have to applaud them because it is a wonderful program um, of, that these young white kids have embarked on. It's another movement. Mm -hmm. And this movement, Bob, really is an old movement that has been renewed because there was a slave in Kentucky who was freed in 1865, has an anonymous, that they don't know his name, and he said that freedom without, without education is not freedom at all. And if you look, it's when you have an uneducated mass, all kinds of problems flow from the miseducation or, or, or uneducation of these people, or any people for that matter. And so we've got to go back and get our hands dirty, it seems to me, and begin to try and teach these young black kids, especially these young black boys, uh, how to read, how to write, and get them inspired to believe that they can be something other than a prisoner. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to my son a few years ago um, and, uh, about this whole problem, and he said, Dad, you know what? 
young kids in the ghetto today don't see prison in the same way that, that you see prison. I said, well, what, what, do you, what, do you, what, what do you mean? He said, well, they'll get three meals a day. They can, they can exercise, build their bodies up, et cetera. They can see all their friends. I said, I see. We have to change people's perception of what is a good thing and a bad thing. And uh, that means then that, unfortunately, some old soldiers like me and some other folks coming along are going to have to say, wait a minute, let's go and try to see can we help these children. This is not about race now so much as it is about the fact that if we don't help these children and get them going in the right direction, we're going to be paying for it seven, eight, nine years down the road mm -hmm. by paying for their incarceration. Mm -hmm. So we have an economic incentive, in my view, to try and make these children into better citizens. What role did SNCC play in some of Dr. King's programs? Well, I think SNCC and King had a positive relationship, but there were tensions at times. Because I think SNCC was a lot more um, aggressive than King. Uh, Snick would, would be willing to go in and fight the lion head on, barehanded. Uh, King uh, might not do it quite that way. But I'll tell you this, though. It wasn't just Snick. It was Malcolm X, too. America had a choice, in my view, during that time of um, do, you, do, you, do you support a Malcolm or do you support a king? And if you have a choice between someone who is saying whites are devils and what have you, and someone who is saying we're all brothers, but each having the same goal, the guy who preaches nonviolence is going to be the one to win. And, and that's really what happened. Uh, king was not any more eloquent than Malcolm X, but his message was more palatable. Um, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was palatable to me, too because we were taught not to be black racists when we were coming up in school. Now that may sound strange to you, but we were taught that we have to be adherents to an inclusive philosophy and that democracy denied to someone else because of their color is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Did you participate in the Freedom Rides? Well, peripherally, yes. Um, Jim, um, let me just tell you, first of all, and I'm writing a book and I'm going to have to put some of these things in the book. The first Freedom Rides, of course, uh, were back in, I guess in the 40s, um, back Jim Farmer. But in December of 1960, um, we sent from Atlanta a bunch of students riding the buses in, into uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Charleston, South Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, Birmingham, Alabama. And, and it's all accounted for. There, there is a documentation of this in the newspapers. The New York Times wrote about what we had done. And so Jim Farmer, head of CORE, called me in January after he saw the article, because it was done near the Christmas holidays. And he wanted to know from me, well, Lonnie, tell me about this. What is it that you all did? And so I told him. He said, well, we're thinking about doing the same thing, out, uh, coming out of New York to Washington on, and on down. And so, in fact, when they got here, I spoke to them over at Clark College as they, as they were coming through. And one of the things I said to them was that you're going to run into an entirely different uh, reception when you get to Birmingham, Alabama. I said, there are two, two guys named Adams who own the service station down there, and they are the most outrageous races down there. And so the next morning they left for going toward Montgomery, but going through Birmingham. Um, and um, I got the word uh, that night that they had attacked the uh, buses and burned them. So a man named Frank Holloway and I got in the car and drove down to, uh, um, I guess it was Gadsden, Alabama at the time. And uh, we went in there hoping that we could maybe help some of them get out or something. There was, there was a dentist down there who was the head of the NACP, so we, we, we actually went to his house because he was someone that we had known. Um, but by the time we actually um, 
got there, they had already uh, kind of quelled everything and they were on their way. So uh, we, we didn't go any further, but uh, Frank Holloway and I did go down there to try to see if we get some of them out of there. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that those Adams boys were, were going to ambush them, mm -hmm. which is what they did. Well, as time passed and battles won, it seems that SNCC began a slow demise and turned into a more of a black power organization. Yeah, um, what happened on that, um, Bob, is that <clears throat> you had some resentment being building up among some of the um, snake people over the fact that some of the whites were more talented as they saw it. Um, and um, it, it kind of boiled over because I think John was the head of it at that time. It kind of boiled over and Stoker Carmichael um, seized upon this feeling and kind of pretty much brought forward this idea of black power. Uh, you, if there was a press release that needed to be written, um, somehow or another, the whites could write the press releases faster than the blacks could, for whatever the reasons. I think a part of that hurt some of these folks and uh, there, were other, there were other little reasons too that I think some of them got all involved. But, but Stokely's position was that blacks can do it too. Now I think he used a code word that did not serve the movement well. Uh, and I would not have used those, uh, those words, but I think that I understood why he did it, but I, don't, but I would not agree with the way he did it. Uh, because to a great extent, the black movement lost an awful lot of goodwill as a result of that particular uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Rap Brown did not help at all by furthering that. You see, um, Bob, I believe that the people who started SNCC um, probably would never have done that. Uh, the people who were running SNCC by the time Stoker came along were the people who grabbed the mantle because many of us had gone on to school some other place. You have to, you have to understand that the students who led this movement were transitory. We were not permanent residents per se. I, well, I was permanent in Atlanta, but by and large, students are, are you know four years, five years, six, depending on how smart you are, whatever your major is, you know, and then you're gone. Mm -hmm. And so, and SNCC was a student-led organization to a great extent. So a lot of the folks who conceived the idea were not there, but the baby was already born, and so someone else started nursing the baby because the other folks had gone. But it served its purpose. Served its purpose. What's and the it, status of SNCC today? I think it's, well, I think, I think that, that the spirit of SNCC is still around. Uh, we're having a 50th reunion up in uh, Raleigh over the next um, Easter weekend. And uh, we'll be all old folks going in there talking about what happened 50 years ago. You know, it's like a family reunion, I guess. Religion played a big part in the movement, didn't it? Yes. We, yeah, because if you, if you follow the Judeo-Christian principles, um, you are going to find yourself um, using religion as a lot of the bases, the songs you sing, um, some of the beliefs that you have, all flow from a religious orientation. And to a great extent, many of us were, were Protestants. Uh, you know, a lot of us were Baptists. Mm -hmm. well, there weren't that many Muslims around mm -hmm. and other people around who had some other kind of, kinds of ideologies. Not that I'm opposed to those folks, I'm just saying though that the, that, that the bulk of us were Southern Baptists. Many, many uh, uh, ministers involved. Well, Bob, that's the myth. Most of your black ministers at that time were not in the movement. Um, because it was unsafe <laughs> to be in the movement. Um, but you did have some, have some courageous ones. The most courageous minister of all was Fred Shuttlesworth mm -hmm. down in Birmingham, who's still alive, by the way, only because he left Birmingham, I think. But <laughs> that, was, to me, that was the most courageous preacher of all. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm happy to see he's in his 80s and he's still here. But ministers did play a major role but the numbers were not great. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 
that there must be 1,500 to, to, to 2,000 churches in the state of Georgia. I doubt that we had 50 churches that were actually movement churches. Mm -hmm. It was unsafe, Bob. They would bomb your church. Mm -hmm. Look at 16th Street Baptist Church in, in Birmingham. They might shoot people. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that people like to do is that they like to keep on living. <laughs> You're right. Do you agree that uh, the behavior of white racists was a plus in the movement? In an indirect way it was because people of goodwill who, who had no dog in that race at all had a chance to see the contrast between the students or the people pushing for rights and the folks who were trying to deny rights. And fair-minded people said, wait a minute now, it's a no-brainer as to who's right here. Especially when you realize that you, are, you have fair-minded people who have been taught in their public schools about democracy, about the 14th Amendment, about freedom. And uh, so it ended up being a situation where I think the overwhelming majority of folks in the world, not just in America, thought that our cause was right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a minute about the uh, FBI surveillance of the <laughs> <Okay>. movement. <clears throat> You got any examples of that? Well, yeah, the FBI, well, I had an FBI contact who talked to me about it once a month. <laughs> it, we got to the point where he, he called me up and he said, you know, why don't we just meet once a month and we just talk? You know, and so, sure enough, once a month, he just sat down and we just have lunch and talk. Um, it wasn't, I did not view him as being someone who was trying to pump me, per se, but I knew I had enough sense to know that um, he was trying to see if there was any reason why he ought to tell Vega Hoover that there was something adverse going on. You see, Hoover uh, was, had this anti-communist fixation with, uh, uh, about him. Anytime you challenge the status quo in America under him, you were a communist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, that, and so we had to kind of outlive Hoover. Interesting enough, uh, when I left to go to Washington, D.C., um, the same FBI agent ended up still talking to me <laughs> once a month. You know, I mean, he'd just show up and talk to me. Um, but um, I don't know how many other folks had those kind of experiences, but, but that, I had a personal one who just talked to me once a month. And I went, to, and I went out and I, and I asked for my files once here in the last few years. And um, Everything is blacked out of my files but my name. Well, I think you'll agree that uh, Dr. King was, uh, uh, without a doubt, the leader oh, no. mm -hmm. of, the, of the civil rights movement. And do you think that's known uh, uh, today among young black Americans? Some black Americans don't even know who Martin King was. But let me just, quite, let me just give you my view. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different from you on this, Bob. Martin King was the voice of the movement, but there were many leaders. Because you cannot overlook the role of A. Philip Randolph, who uh, espoused the first march on Washington in, in 1941 against Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Or Dorothy Height, who was still alive, by the way, at 90, whatever. Or uh, Whitney Young, uh, Roy Wilkins, in their own way, these persons um, played a major role because each one of them had a constituency. But none of them had the voice of Martin King, trained preacher, son of a preacher, grandson of a preacher. So it was so speaking was in his was in his innards. But I would not say that was a collective leadership, in my opinion. Mod, but, but, but of the collective leadership, Martin King was the voice. Mm -hmm. And that's his voice that you hear because that voice could articulate in such a way that if he was commenting on Shakespeare, he could make an average person in the street say amen. Mm -hmm. uh, only once in a lifetime do you find someone who can take the words and turn them into something that is pliable, that people can say, you know, he's talking to me. Mm -hmm. He's inspiring me. King could do that. 
-hmm. So I'm saying to you that uh, I would not say he was the leader of the movement, but I would say that he was the leading voice of the movement. Mm -hmm. And I only say that because I cannot, having been so close to the movement, dismiss the role of the NACP, the mm -hmm. Urban League, and other folks who were also working just as aggressively, but whose leaders did not have the voice that mm -hmm. King had. Is there a voice today? Not in my view, no, no. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in the sense that maybe if there was a voice, the person's, he'd be on the hit list of these right wingers. Right. Uh, you have a more localized or regionalized voice or voices today. And we're becoming more like white people, <laughs> okay? There is no white voice per se, unless it's the president, but now the president's black. So, so, this is a, so you, I think it's good to, to not have, see, because if you shoot down the leader or the voice, you kill the movement. That's what a lot of folks thought was going to happen. And in fact, to a great extent, it did happen. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to diversify. And that's what we've done accidentally. I don't think it was on purpose. Mm -hmm. Looking back, Lonnie, what do you think was the movement's greatest triumph? In the long run, the greatest triumph, I think, was really the Voting Rights Act. When you start talking about triggering people's vote into representative government. But it's going to take a while for us to really experience that particular benefit of the movement. The most immediate impact of the movement was the um, physical uh, changes in terms of where people could sit, what you could, where, where you could go, or where you could buy houses, those kind of things. But that was, that was almost immediate. But the long range thing that's going to play a much, much more significant role as we go forward and into the future is going to be the impact of the Voter Rights Act. We're going to find in what, 20, what was it, 20, is it, is it, I've forgotten the year now, but, but it was renewed for 25 more years. You can have a battle when it comes up for renewal next time. Because there are going to be people who are going to still realize that, you know, we need to keep these folks from voting because they might vote us out of office. <laughs> what about a, the biggest failure or disappointment? In my view, the biggest failure, and I have to say this is Monday morning quarterbacking, we did not figure out a way to pass the baton on to other young college students who were coming along. Remind you, I said early on that it's the, it's the young folks who are the soldiers. And we weren't able to pass that on. Uh, and I don't want to unfairly criticize us, but I'm telling you that that's what I think happened. Um, had we passed it on, we should have talked about the next step, which is economic development. And uh, see, you want to go buy a hamburger, but you need to make enough money to be able to afford the hamburger. Uh, and I don't think that we really found a way to take us to public accommodation, then take us to voting rights, and then take us to economic development. Somehow or another, we haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the tragedies, Bob, in my view of the movement, is that those of us, uh, myself included, uh, went to sleep when we gained these unprecedented rights. And a lot of us have been asleep for almost 50 years. Rip Van Winkle only slept 20, but we've been asleep for a long time. But while we were asleep, the people who were opposed to us getting rights in the first place have been wide awake. And they have been slowly but surely stacking the Supreme Court, stacking the district courts, stacking the Court of Appeals. They, they realized that they could not, from a public policy point of view, change the Civil Rights Acts, change the Voting Rights Acts, change the Housing Acts. But what they did do was they worked on a, a concerted strategy. Let's change the people who are interpreting the laws. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. So therefore, you look out here now and you see people who are sitting on these benches making decisions. They don't overrule the Civil Rights Acts. They just rule against you on summary judgment. Mm -hmm. And if you lose a case on summary judgment, 
you got a 99 chance out of 100 of not succeeding on the appellate level. So you've been denied access through these appointments. Um, and to an extent, you have a repeat of what happened after, after, after uh, Reconstruction. You had the Klan then going around killing people, trying to make sure that we keep a separate but equal. You now have, through the last 40 years of Republican control, you have white-collar criminals who go in and become a federal judge, and they tend to um, interpret the law against you. Let me give you a case in point. <clears throat> George Bush, the last George Bush, wanted to appoint a person to the Court of Appeals in the Fourth Circuit up in South Carolina, Virginia. So the Democrats opposed the gentleman, along with many other civil rights organizations. But when they got down to the man's record, they found out that there had been several hundred civil rights cases that had come before him as a district judge. He ruled against every last one of those persons who had filed a complaint of discrimination, and it was hundreds of them, at summary judgment, which meant that they didn't even get in the court. They filed and he ruled against them on the papers that were there. He's saying basically there's not enough of a case here for you to go forward for a full trial. He did that for several hundred, but one case he did agree that, that, that you met the threshold for a probable cause. And that was a case of a white man in South Carolina who alleged reverse discrimination based on the Civil Rights Act. Now he didn't get he didn't get the appointment because that was just so blatant. But he's just a poster boy, in my view, of the kind of behind the scenes machinations that the Republicans, especially those from the South, were, were involved in trying to roll back behind the scenes in the dead of night the gains of people who fought to try to become a part of the American uh, democracy. What do you think are the most important issues facing African Americans today? Well, there's so many. But most important, I think, would be education again, trying to find a way to get more of these young black folks educated so that they can become more productive in society for themselves. And if they're productive themselves, then the overall society is more, is more productive. Uh, tied into that, of course, would be to work on the dropout rate. Uh, it's, a, it's a crime for one out of two children to be, to be dropping out of school for, for whatever the reasons. And we've got to look at it. And we don't need to keep waiting for white people to come and save us. We have to, as African Americans, begin to try to save ourselves. Uh, we've got to call a spade a spade. We've got to say to black people who are not doing their job, you got to do your job. Just like, we, just like we call out white people, we got to call out black people. So it's education. Then I think that education, would, if you get enough education, then people learn how to be business people, how to be professors, or how to be whatever. And you begin to create a whole different kind of society. But right now, we have a society wherein a lot of people who are under 20 think that they might be dead before they're 25. And so, let me get it all now. And what that means is that I'm going to go and rob Bob's house <laughs> and get some of what he has. I'm going to go and rob your house and get some of what you have. We, the way we stop that is not only through public safety, increasing public safety, but you've got to also be able to get people to understand that there are some choices that you, uh, that, you risk, that you should be making that you're not making. Isn't that what Bill Cosby has been saying? Bill Cosby was 100% right. He was, he was attacked by, by people that are ne'er-do-wells. You see, um, if you tell the people the truth sometimes, it's very, very disconcerting. The easiest thing in the world, Bob, is to say, you know, the devil made me do it. Or, you know, these white racists did it to me. Um, if, they break, if they break into my, if some black folks break into my house with a gun to my head and they want to shoot my wife, I can't blame somebody who's not even in the neighborhood. We got to deal with the reality and not have um, racism, reverse racism, as the scapegoat. And uh, my m Cosby's message is not popular. I'm sure mine won't be popular either. 
But I don't think that, that the best tenants of America are couched in this kind of language that these people are involved in. Mm -hmm. Bill Cosby was right 100%. Well, what has life been like for Lonnie King after <laughs> your civil rights career? Or are you still a civil rights activist? Well, I think I'm going to probably always be that for the rest of my life. Uh, uh, I had a chance to go off to get a Ph.D. in economics and become a college professor um, under Dr. E.B. Williams years ago. I was, when I was at Morehouse. I turned that down and went on into this area. And as life would have it, I'm back into the college. I'm teaching, you know, at Georgia State, you know. So in a way, I'm doing what, what I was slated to be doing in the late 50s and early 60s. And I'm doing it at the end of my life as opposed to at the first part of my life. But I've had a very, very good opportunity here. I've been a senior manager in the federal government. I've run my own company. I've been a real estate developer. So I've done a lot of stuff. And, and I learned a lot about how you, how you can get things done, uh, especially about how to organize them. So Tell I'm us about your family. I have a wife and three kids, uh, and they're all doing very well. My grandkids are doing well, too. Um, I have a grandkid, uh, one grandkid who is the oldest, who is, um, uh, his name is um, <coughs> Drew Ford. Um, this, 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 this kid is um, a Renaissance man. He is, lives out in Fayette County, and he, is, uh, he made one B in school. Uh, he's gotten an offer from over 100 and some colleges to come. Um, one of them, of course, being Harvard. Um, and I think he's going to do well. He's, uh, he plays for the um, Junior Symphony here for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. He's in the first chair as a viola um, this year. Um, he's a champion um, debater. Uh, I'm just proud of him. I mean, he, he's really quite a fellow. Uh, and his young brother coming behind him is even, be he's even smarter than he is. <laughs> so, so I've tried my best to get my children and my grandchildren going in a certain direction. I don't want them to be victims, um, and I want them, they should not be victimized to anybody else either. Get your education and move forward. Now, my, my daughter was trying to say to me, well, Dad, he has a chance to go to Harvard, but you know, um, he, he can go to Georgia Tech too. I said, let me tell you something. Georgia Tech is a great school, no question about it. But there's only one Harvard. And if, you're, and if Harvard wants your son to come, you need to go. Well, Lana King, you've been a very interesting and informative guests, guest, and I want to thank you for being on our program. Well, thank tonight. you very much for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to um, viewing this and so forth and so on. Good it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. It really is. No a hair, lot. and you still have yours. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of old memories. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much for the interview, okay? We enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.